Recording Live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America, bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running, nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Ben Crossman, and everyone out there, I hope that you're doing well and you are ready for today's show. Uh, Today has been a very, very busy day when it comes to technology, and I'm really happy that we have uh, the one, the only, Scott Schober here to talk about a lot of it. And, you know, a lot of it does have to, um, you know, a lot of it does have to do with security in so many ways ways. And, you know, uh, he's going to be able to help us break it down very, very easily. If you haven't heard uh, from Scott Schober before, then uh, where have you been? And also, hey, check out his website, scottschober.com. He's an author. He is, of course, um, you know, he is, of course, an, an analyst. He's been on many, many publications, and we're always happy to have him on here with us. So with that being said, everyone, let's go ahead and uh, just real quick, computeramerica.com. Check it out. Uh, we were shooting for one review a day, and today has just been so busy behind the scenes here that that's, uh, nope, hey, we're, we're, we're two for the week, so maybe I'll, uh, you know, I'll find the courage to write two tomorrow. But uh, so far, we did the, the Nanoleaf lighting system and the Alienware 31-inch monitor. Uh, both of those have been, you know, sitting around waiting for good reviews, and hey, we, uh, we finally got to it. So find us on social media, at Computer America, all that good stuff, show notes after the show up on the website. Let's go ahead and bring on our guest and start talking about all of the different stuff to talk about. As I said before, Scott Schober, we first met him when he was simply the author of Hacked Again, and you know he's been a regular correspondent here on Computer America ever since. Ever since then, cybersecurity is everybody's business, and or everybody, everyone's. I always get that confused in my head. But either way, he uh, he's an author. He's, of course, doing uh, columns, and he's doing uh, interviews on news and things like that, and we're very happy to have him. Scott, welcome back onto Computer America. How you doing? I'm doing great. Great, great to be here with you again, there, Ben. Our pleasure, our pleasure. And yeah, uh, thank you for uh, you know, thank you for taking the time. I'm sure that you, uh, you know, obviously we talked about this last time you were on the show. Um, you know, the pandemic has disrupted so much business, but uh, I'm sure in your line of work and you know, kind of what we do here as well, it's uh, it's only gotten busier. So man, it's uh, it's busy, busy. So thank you for your time. Yeah, no, not a problem at all. You you make a great point. I think. Of anything, in a couple of the the articles and things I've even been reading and doing research on, COVID nineteen is now declared probably the biggest disruptor to the business community of anything ever. Um, so, and it's because it infects everybody's lives one way or another, and especially it, it crisscrosses in so many different ways in in my realm and in, in cybersecurity. So, yeah, a lot, a lots to talk about. Yeah, and you know uh, this is a tangent, but just yesterday I was reading a uh, a report from uh, 2015 where they were reading about uh, well where stu- uh, scientists were studying COVID in um, not COVID 19 because it was discovered in 2019, but uh, different strains of COVID. Um, well, it's like SARS version two or whatever, mm-hmm. uh, in bats in 2015, like they were saying that, you know, this was rife, uh, for jumping to human host and things like that. This is something that we should be prepared for, blah, blah, blah back in 2015. And then, uh, someone else, and then that study linked to another study that was done in 2005, where they had mm-hmm. similar concerns back in 2005. And, you know, uh, I'm sure that there's hundreds and hundreds of um, potential threats out there and things that we should, you know, kind of, you know, uh, be concerned about. But it just takes one of them, in this case, you know, COVID-19, to really throw everything up in the air. So it, I, I, the origins of this whole thing are fascinating as well, but uh, a tangent, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I, I've done some research on it too, and I still don't have a full grasp on where it came from, the the origin of it, do they got a handle on it? 
Do they they're, have anything that will combat it? We don't know. <laughs> they're, they're, and, and, and luckily for everyone, you know, if, if we want to start out with some good news, uh, luckily a number of uh, test trials and vaccines are in stage three now, uh, as many people who yeah. watch the news know. Uh, so hopefully by the end of the year, we're looking at some kind of uh, cure. Luckily, it is a strain of SARS and, you know, uh, coronavirus. So there have been other vaccines that were already in process that could be tweaked just a little bit to work with what uh-huh. we're working with. Uh, uh, and as far as I know, uh, bats seem to be, you know, kind of uh, breeding grounds for uh, this huh. kind of thing. So it made the transfer in some way from bats to humans. And hey, we're not a science show, but it's uh, mm. like I said, this is affecting and you're right. The end result is that more and more things are not just the cloud. I, I haven't heard too many people really uh, talk about the cloud lately, but because I, I, I think the cloud is just so ubiquitous that everyone just knows it's the cloud. Um, but yeah, more and more things are shifting online, which means more vulnerabilities, more data, more traffic, more, uh, more victims, unfortunately. So, yeah. 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 I think the, the, the one thing that's a real standout for me that comes up again and again and again is is now kind of everybody has shifted to this working with or working in a mobile workforce, remote working, adapting and adjusting to that as the new norm has really, I think, changed the landscape of where the threats are and how hackers are operating and what's being exploited. And it's, I guess it's a little bit like a field day for cyber criminals. And, and that's the part that concerns me so much. And it, it almost happened overnight. It's not like we could plan for this at, you know, this date, at this time, a switch gets flipped. It just happened, and it's the new norm that we have to adapt to. And so many companies, I think, have had to adapt and focus a lot more attention on, you know, cleaning and, and sterilizing things and de- 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 all the different aspects of, you know, hand sanitizer, gloves, social distancing, masks. Mm-hmm. That's a lot of the focus. A less focus probably has been on cybersecurity, which is now a big concern because now all these breaches and compromises are happening at the fore. Well, yeah, and and there's a couple of stories here that I wanted to you know uh, kind of get your take on before we move on to some of the other sure. ones that you sent over. Uh, I mean, the very first thing though is kind of uh, a reannouncement because we mentioned it on Monday when it was first announced. But uh, CES 2021 is going all virtual. There will be no physical event this year. So just kind of leading to what we were just talking about. Yeah, and, and that, I was, I guess, uh, in some ways a little bit surprised, but not surprised. I was surprised uh, it took them this be- long, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that it would have been an announcement done much sooner based upon what's happened. And maybe they were hoping that that numbers would drop and statistically the, the chances of having shows would just increase and other people would kind of do it. But it looks like show after show throughout this year, this calendar year, everything's been canceled that I I, I'm presenting at or we're exhibiting at. So CES is usually beginning of January. So it's right around that time that people may or may not be making some adjustments in their plans, but people typically book CES because it's such a large event. Well, a year in advance at least. Oh yeah. So the mindset right now is not to go to a large area with a lot of people. So and I why think last put money year, down? Yeah, yeah, and, and I think last year was about 180,000 people. Yeah. So it's oh, yeah. uh, it was certainly something. And and you know uh, I'm uh, I'm not going to take credit. I'm not going to take credit for it. I did receive an email uh, because I was a past attendee saying you know would you be interested in attending again? And I said oh heck no, you should cancel this immediately. So uh, I'm not going to take full credit, but hey, they, I think they, they listened, listened to, to your voice, Ben. I yeah. think they did. I think they did. But uh, like I said, I'm surprised it took them that long. So with that being said, uh, a lot of these companies are going to have virtual events. They're going to announce things online. And uh, one of the uh, one of the articles that we did, let's see, this uh, we published this. Uh, I think this was, let's see. Uh, yeah, this is Tuesday. So this happened yesterday as well. But uh, and I have a couple, I have a couple stories here. This big one, I'm not sure, Scott, if you recall it. I, it's been two days. It's uh, yeah, it's been two days. It's uh, probably ancient history by now. Uh, the massive source code leak from 50 different high-profile companies, including Microsoft, Disney, Nintendo, and uh, I think Nintendo got a lot of the. Uh, 
a lot of the attention because it was the source the code for some of the uh, yeah a lot of the fanfare because uh, a lot of the old video games that people used to play like uh, Super Mario 64 uh, were leaked so people can make their own versions of that and look through the source code but still even beyond that uh, yeah, Giga Leak. I mean, it had, like I said, it had everything from Microsoft to Apple to Nintendo to so many huge companies. And it was all done by a single gentleman who put up all the code on uh, GitLab, where he posted all, all of the source code from all these different companies. And he just went back and said, you know, I hope no, uh, I hope no one gets in trouble for this. And he just went out there and leaked it. So I was wondering if you had heard about uh, what they're now calling GigaLeak and what your response is on someone just kind of, you know, he, he doesn't seem like a malicious actor. He just seems like someone who had the information and published it. Yeah, I, th I think in this case, it, it was, wow, I can't believe this is out there. And, and sometimes publishing it doesn't always have uh, uh, malice intent there. He's not looking to, to gain money from it or anything like that, but me, more to maybe expose or put it out there so things could be corrected quickly. Um, because some of these companies are, are solid companies, big names. And when you hear about it, you kind of kind of cringe, especially anything to do with um, source code, intellectual property value. That's, that's the, the, you know, the golden crown jewels to certain companies. When that gets out there, that could be very concerning. Admittedly, some of this may have been some older information. Um, so how valuable it is, we don't exactly know. And uh, the fact that it's just put out there makes you concerned. What, what it tells me is if you're running a company, an organization, anything that you hold value that's digital, you have to keep close, near and dear to you. Obviously, keep it backed up, but keep it protected. Having it out there or accessible very easily is where the problem lies. And unfortunately, as we talked about before, the world of COVID, remote workforce, access to remote servers, the entire world is accessible from anywhere now because everything is out on the internet. And mm -hmm. if, it, if you don't properly protect it, these type of things will happen again and again and again. That's scary. Yeah. Yeah, for, for sure. And even in uh, this article here uh, from Business Insider, but they're saying that some of these internal documents, even though they are, you know, decades old in some cases, uh, that could be enough. Uh, they mentioned that uh, just like information that people may pull from individuals, that that information, even decades old, can still be used to, I guess, for uh, spear phishing or phishing attempts, things like that, that you think, oh, they have not you know internal knowledge of some of the projects within nintendo they must be a reputable source let's go ahead and say oh uh you know i was working on x project a couple of years ago can you let me back into the system i need you know uh, cha they change the password and i, and I need back mm -hmm. in uh, is something like that a, a concern for all these different companies now oh absolutely especially when you get down to source code and then somebody can compile it Keep in mind, and, and any coder knows this, and again, my background is, is software, so mm -hmm. I'm used to programming and I understand how software engineers think and how they work. It's rare that somebody writes an original routine from scratch every single application that they create or, or, or a program that they write. Why? Because there's so many routines that handle certain things again and again. So they may take a subroutine here or a piece here or something that handles this graphic motion or the sound and they reuse it. So when you have access to somebody, especially a gaming company where you could reuse some of that code and it may take a hundred coders a number of years ago to create a good game and they sell it for X number of dollars. Once that's compromised, different pieces of that could be used and built upon to build new games and enhance games. So that's really, really valuable. <laughs> And, and should never be compromised. Yeah, for sure. And and I was even looking through some of the other companies, and um, you know, he kind of had listed all here, everything from GE appliances to Adobe to Lenovo. Uh, they even had one uh, fintech and Italian bank as well. And they said that uh, you know he did his best, although I don't know how 
you know, I, I'm sure that he's good at collecting the information and publishing it. I don't know how good he is, uh, you know, how studious he is in actually deleting the credentials. But he said, in some cases, there were hard-coded credentials, which I'm assuming means something like, uh, you know, this login and this password will always work as long as this, uh, you know, as long as this system is in place. Like they hard-coded mm -hmm. credentials that are still in place. Yeah, and I think one thing is if if you peer through that list a little bit, you will notice, you'll get a glimpse. Some of those companies do provide security products and services. They provide access control. So these are things that get you into other facilities, be it retail, be it banks, be it uh, you know, facilities that are protecting important information and computer networks that are protecting that information. So it, it kind of breaks the wall down a little bit when you have access into things at different levels. It could be concerning. Yeah, it, it was just such a massive leak. And, uh, you know, I, 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 like you just said, a lot of the fanfare went to the video games because that's uh, that's kind of the fun side. But there's a lot of documents that, you know, uh, I'm sure even Microsoft has proprietary um, has proprietary. Uh, coding out there that let's say if even if they leak something like windows 95 or 98 uh and the entire source code for that i mean scott that still has value to hackers who may potentially target uh systems like that i mean now th now they get essentially the entire user manual uh and they can go through it line by line and really you know really find all the vo all of the vulnerabilities right yeah and, and i think again to your point one of the critical areas when you have source code embedded in a lot of the source code are these back doors that companies put in because they know they need access. Yeah, it may have been created five years ago, 10 years ago, but they're gonna oftentimes reuse this backdoor access that the public yeah. does not know. Hackers want backdoor access. That's one of the primary ways they can actually uh, exploit programs and get into computer networks and, and do their havoc. So. This is definitely some some seriously concerning information that got out there. How much they use and when, I guess only time will tell. So with that, uh, if we're you know kind of pulling up news from recent uh, from recent days, the other big one that um, that I wanted to cover was Garmin. I'm sure that you've heard about Garmin, and they are being held ransom for ten million dollars. That was on Monday. I think it happened over the weekend, and they were trying their best, but they finally came out and said, well. Uh, Ten million dollar ransomware is on our system, and it was unable to be stopped. Like they, they even said uh, th the way that the articles were kind of written made it sound like the IT was made aware when some things weren't acting correctly, and they tried to shut down the system from their end, but things weren't shutting down, and so they were calling everyone within the organization of Garmin to just kind of unplug computers, just yank power cords from yank walls. Yank the cords. <laughs> yeah, they, they were trying their best, and they still got, well, hey, they got got. Um, the, the end result was a like all of their online services that all their smart products, all of their fitness products, things like that uh, were taken down for uh, last I heard yesterday, multiple services were coming back online, but I think that they're still dealing with this. So when it comes to ransomware and Garmin, Scott, you've been on the show for years and we've been talking about this and you know, uh, this happens and this is probably one of the highest profile ones that will happen this year. Garmin, $10 million. What do you think about that? Yeah, uh, certainly. I think anytime ransomware, we talked to even just a few years ago, we're talking $600, $1,000. One Bitcoin. Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah. And, and now now when you hear stuff on some of these demanded ransoms for a half a million to 10 million in Bitcoin, this is some sizable cash. It's concerning. And think about it. Why? It's because they're going after huge companies that have brand name, they have recognition, they're providing services that tied up to a wide consumer base. So when that many consumers are disrupted, they're going to look at their Garmin fitness watch or whatever other product or navigation because it's tied closely to GPS. Consumers are going to complain. When consumers complain, they stop using hardware, they stop using services, they, they cancel, and they migrate to the competitor. So that is a very scary thing. In, in, in the sick back of my mind, I often always wonder, and this was a, a wasted locker by, a, I guess, Evil Corp, they, they claim is behind some of this, at least the strain. Right. Um, 
you analyze and ask yourself, is it possible, has it ever been possible or is it happening that competitive companies are hiring a third party to place and launch these ransomware attacks? Because when one strong brand falls, everybody migrates to another brand. I'm not saying that's the case. So I don't want to go on the record for that, but right. wouldn't that be a clever activity? Highly illegal, but yes. Cl- Highly but, but illegal, clever. but it would be brilliant if a company could pull that off. Um, and that's just, I'm, I'm always thinking these things in the background because besides monetary gain in this case, which is a lot of money mm-hmm. uh, and a little bit of fame and fortune that you could say, hey, I'm, I'm the hackers behind the... Uh, the Garmin attack, what are, what are they doing it for? Well, it will probably money number one, money number two, and but, <laughs> but also bragging rights is pretty popular. And maybe there's that uh, hire a hacker that's starting to happen more and more. Companies are trying to take their competitors out of the marketplace. They'll hire a hacker and you could do a DDoS attack, send them out strains of ransomware, make their life miserable. Yeah, it's, it's an effective business tactic that that is illegal. Yeah, oh, oh, oh for sure. And we have seen uh, numerous cases where uh, take something like Intel, you know, something that they had some vulnerabilities that were discovered. I don't think that they were planted by anyone, but they had some that were discovered. And yeah, you know, corporate America just kind of had to sit up and say, we've been taking Intel for granted, you know, uh, with the, it was like the something ghost in the afterburn or whatever it was. Uh, yeah, that, you know, Intel definitely had a financial loss when it came to uh, instances such as that. But uh, let's assume that's not, and, and really uh, Evil Corp, I think the NCC group did a very nice write-up of this whole uh, situation. And I think e- Evil Corp, they're weird. They're like, you know, they purposely don't go for uh, consumer data, even though they might have access to it that has not been proven yet. But yeah, they just they just try to get the money and try to take down services. So not saying they're the good guys, but they have some strange ethics. And yeah, they hey. have their own set of ethics, I guess you could say, right? Uh, Creative. Yeah, and uh, although I, I've I've met with Gar- Garmin representatives and uh, the people over at Garmin, you know, they uh, a long time like back when GPSs were still a thing, uh, they were sponsors of the show. They're nice people. Uh, they, oh yeah, they, great, great group. Yeah, and uh, but I, I guess it's easier to hack a nameless, faceless giant organization and steal money than an individual person. So there you go. Okay, so very, very um, Scott, I'm trying to think of and oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was just going to say one one uh, last thought on this is probably for, for, for those watching or listening. I can't emphasize enough the importance of backing up your data. We've preached it a million times in, in That's the this best way case to recover. in many cases. Yeah. You got something to fall back on to recover so you're not victims to pay out the ransom. So just, maybe it's just the, the friendly Wednesday reminder. When have you last backed up your data? Might be time to do it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, it, it, but uh, and to any large organizations, I think this is what the city of Philadelphia had to deal with. They mm. backed up all of their data. Their other problem was, uh, whoops. <laughs> it, it, well, 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 no, they, they they were good. They backed up their data. They didn't have a plan to implement. You know, they they had no yes. strategy to get you know fifteen thousand computers back online, back booted up to what it was. Uh, and it still took them weeks and weeks and millions of dollars to get their system back up because, you know, it's just like having a fire, um, you know, a, a fire escape route. You know, that's why you have fire drills. Uh, I feel like these companies, they make backups, which is perfect, but then they never run drills. They never uh, yeah. put the plan into action. Oh, sure. Yeah. I, so. I had a, a situation, unfortunately, recently I did an OS update. Mm-hmm. I was excited. It's the latest and greatest. I'm always on top of it. Got to keep on top <laughs> of it. Bam. I had all kinds of problems as a result. This was Apple. So I called Apple. I was on the phone for two hours. Then I was on the phone for three hours. Mm-hmm. And I was said, well, you know what? I have no other choice but to resort to my backup. You know what the suggestion was? Well, What's hold that? off to, to, to rebuild it and actually do a proper backup to restore that may take you the course of several days. And I went, oh. I don't have several days to properly do this. Now, admittedly, I have a lot of data that I back up regularly. I have about 640,000 emails that is part of that. (laughs) It's a pretty big number, and I had a lot of concern there, so I'm still working through that mess. But it, it helps me again. And again, I have it set up so it does a regular daily backup 
which is not the whole full backup. It just makes any changes. Incremental, yeah. Time capsule, capsule using incremental. But I have a plan in place. The question is, everybody should ask themselves, what is your plan? It can't be like, well, hey, it's a sunny day and I'll wash my car. I'll do it this month. I'll, if not, I'll do it next month. You, you got to have something that's a little more regimented because you never know when you will be the victim of ransomware, especially when it may not be you clicking on it. It could be an employee yeah. or somebody that's part of your workforce, a third party associated to your company. Who knows? But having that backup and having it disconnected is important to a lot of people think, well, it's connected. It's okay. Fine. I'll, and guess what? That strain may go right on your backup as well. And, and the same too with the cloud. That's starting to happen. There some of these new strains of ransomware. It's uh, it's sitting up in the cloud there, and your backups in the cloud, and you're busted, and you don't even realize it. And so, lo lots of things to be concerned with these days as it keeps migrating, changing, getting harder and harder to uh, fight these cyber criminals. For sure, for sure. And I think the last story that we did uh, this week that is kind of related to this, it's just real mm -hmm. quick. Uh, Gmail recently, they, they launched it with a certain amount of partners, but they're going to expand it where they are doing uh, much like HTTPS with the secure and the authentication, the certificates, blah, blah, blah. Uh, essentially, they're validating that uh, the website is the website that you're on. And uh, looks like Google is going to start doing that in Gmail with company logos. So that if you see the FedEx, if you see the CNN logo, if you see whatever logo that you deal with on a regular basis, it's not just some hacker copying, pasting, and putting in their own uh, link. So Google is going to start working with, uh, with verified logos and that will be spread out further and scott this is what i really like about that story was i like it when uh you know ignoring the size of, of gmail and google and all that kind of thing i like it when these large organizations uh kind of take the onus onto themselves and mm -hmm. they don't tell everyone oh just don't click on a bad link no looks like you know google is starting to well i'm sure they fight this every single day but they're they're, they continue to enhance the, the security on their end, and therefore millions of their users are automatically more secure. Yeah, and I think when you think about uh, Gmail, and I, I don't know, I should know how many users there are of Gmail, but it's a lot. I know I have it, and, and probably everybody I know has it one way or another. Um, it's important, and to keep consumers' confidence to coming back to Google, I mean, let's face it, I think Google's testifying with Microsoft and a couple other companies, Apple, and I forget the, uh, is it Microsoft, mm -hmm. I believe, uh, today. So these tech giants are constantly trying to defend themselves from a privacy standpoint, slowly implement more and more security features, but not lose consumers' confidence for convenience because everybody's about convenience over security. So they're always juggling that. Like, like you said, though, it's nice when a tech company will take a stand and take some initiative, hopefully for, for keeping uh, consumers happier. I think uh, it's a smart move, especially in anything in the world of security, because everybody is sick and tired of being compromised. They're sick and tired of phishing scams. They're sick and tired of email spoofing and everything else going on in the world of email, all the junk that's going on. Um, a lot of time is wasted and it's, 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 it's a disaster. So it does need to be improved. It needs to be fixed. I liken it maybe to the federal government's physical mail system, which gets a lot of criticism. Um, but it's scary when you now can contrast it and say, geez, it's actually more reliable now to send a physical letter to somebody yeah. than an email, perhaps. That's not good. <laughs> For sure, for sure. And and by the way, uh, just some quick Google foo and uh, out comes the response of October 2018. There were 1.5 billion hmm. Gmail accounts. Wow. That is the most recent number we have. So about 1.5 billion. And the number is probably closer to uh, almost probably 2 billion after a year and a half. Uh, yeah. Two, uh, oh, I'm, I'm sure it, it has to be close to 2 billion Gmail accounts. Wow. So, I mean, how many how many people are there on the face of the globe? I think about seven point seven something billion, maybe. Yeah, seven point six or something like that. Seven point seven. Uh, and a little more than half have internet access, which I think is so say three point five billion roughly. Yeah. So it's about half Gmail people use Gmail. By, yeah, yeah, half the people. That's huge. 
Admittedly, Ooh. I'm sure people have multiple Gmail accounts, but still, it's yes. uh, it's it's the most popular. It's much like the browser wars. Uh, Chrome is winning that one. So, with all of yeah. that being said, uh, that those are all the most recent ones. I wanted your input. Thank you for that. Uh, sure. But now, of course, talking about more recent events, there's. Uh, this first article, though, that you sent over, uh, I'm very interested because we've talked about getting into different areas of the tech field. I've never really given any consideration to advocating. Uh, like, like I, I know that cybersecurity professionals are sorely needed in you know, because, like we've been talking about, every large organization needs their own. Uh, what I'm sorry, would benefit from having cybersecurity professionals. Uh, I've never talked about using cybersecurity as a career, but Krebs on security, um, amazing source. Uh, I guess he wrote this column and it caught your attention. Why is that? Yeah. And, and I always give Brian credit. He, he's a, a great source for uh, integrity in everything he writes. If he screws up and says something wrong, he will retract it. He'll apologize. He'll set things straight. He does, he does a great job, I think, of reporting things, investigating things. And he, and he learns it and he gets his, his feet on the ground, understands the technology and learns it. And I think this was very um, revealing, this article. And it really stood out when I was reading through it because he was candid. And he said, here he is, a, a former Washington Post reporter with years of experience and now in the tech realm for many years, posting and putting up an incredible blog, reporting on these things. And he said he doesn't himself have any certifications or specific education in this field of cybersecurity. Yet, as you mentioned, he's an authority. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The world of media knows him. The world of cybersecurity, maybe the gen general populace doesn't necessarily know him as a household name, but that's okay because he is brilliant. He does hard work and he does his research. So what's telling about this article, I think, is, is the candor that he puts forth is more importantly than a degree or a certification in the world and the niche of cybersecurity, if you're considering a career, which I always encourage people to do, a lot of his other skills, ancillary skills that are probably as important or more important than just that piece of paper he's saying. And what are some of those skills? And I think it's important for anybody that's listening or watching this to realize if you want a career, this applies in cybersecurity, but it really applies in a lot of things in general. Um, Hands-on experience is really important today, and it's lacking in so many ways. And what do I mean by that? You're going to get a two-year degree, a four-year degree, master's, whatever. That's all wonderful. I, I, went, the, I went the route. Uh, to go to college, you get a degree and learned a lot. And, and you do learn a lot of practical things. But at the same time, to his point, if you're, if you're looking for a career in cybersecurity, he said, it's good to have computer understanding, good to be a techie, almost as if you're a, you're a hobbyist. Mm -hmm. You enjoy getting on the computer and tinkering and playing around with things. Um, and, and maybe it's you know, a webcam and it's interfacing to other things and it's maybe it's cobbling up a little bit of code, writing some routines. Maybe it's interfacing to a display and understanding input output. When you, when you become a hobbyist in the space, you take on a different excitement and energy and you learn how to do investigation and you learn how to find where cyber criminals are and you learn how to fight the bad guys and almost start to think like a bad guy. Well, if I was a hacker, what would I do? How would I hack into this password? So it's a little bit of that investigative forensics type of work often that spills over into cybersecurity, which excites me, I think. Um, but I appreciate here just how important he is saying some of the underlying things are, he talks a little bit in the article about the packets, the bits and the bytes, understanding what the terminology is there. So I always encourage people, get, get some books on computers, tinker on your computer, tinker with electronics, try a little programming. It doesn't mean you have to be a programmer mm -hmm. and you sit there every day pounding at the keyboard. I used to do that in my younger years when I was actually hacking, writing code and hacking into bulletin board systems and guessing passwords and doing all kinds of bad stuff. <laughs> um, now I'm not doing that. Now I'm hopefully de developing tools with a team that's fighting cyber criminals 
so we can catch them in the act and working in conjunction with law enforcement and sharing information and doing research. So my career path has changed drastically, but a lot of the backbone of the stuff I could relate to so clearly with, with what Brian Krebs wrote here in this piece, thinking about a uh, cybersecurity career. And to me, I'm, the answer was always yes. Uh, and I'm proud my nephew recently, my sister has triplet boys. They are all going to college and one, one, one went to the Marines and then two of them went to college, I should say. One of them mm -hmm. just accepted into a, a cybersecurity program, SUNY University up in New York. Very nice. And uh, so exciting to hear his excitement and what can I expect and wh what area should I focus in on? And so it, it's kind of neat living through other people that are going through similar feelings that I've been through or am going through. So at least if nothing else, I encourage people, give it a shot. If you're not familiar, you don't have to be a computer geek to be in the cybersecurity field. There are now so many niches that have opened up and it basically affects every single company needs help in the world of cybersecurity, whether it's internal IT staff, whether it's a dedicated security team, whether it's a, an outside company that you're part of that goes in and does, you know, breach, uh, pen damage testing. control, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Pen testing, vulnerability assessments, um, speaking about it, reporting about it, writing about it. Uh, there, there's a probably a thousand different niches that I've come across just in the world of cybersecurity. So find the niche that excites you the most. Talk to people that are involved in it. Feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to, to share any of my thoughts for what they're worth, but, but give it a shot and, and, and use an article like this to motivate yourself and realize you don't have to have that very specialized certificate. Hey, nothing against people that have certificates. If you, if you put in the sweat, the effort, the money, the time, and you got a certificate, good for you. You deserve that or, or a degree or anything else. Excellent. And I'm not knocking that. However, some of the hands-on skills for today are what's needed today. And that's what's important. And some of it's just more common sense and practical things because- yeah. Today's breaches are very different than the breaches we were talking about last year. So some of the principles and things you use, the core stuff is the same, but your approach to handling it is different when you're combating cyber criminals. Yeah, it's uh, and especially when it comes to cybersecurity in particular, I've noticed that a lot of the uh, a lot of the high tech hacking it doesn't really come in the wild. It doesn't really come from no. uh, hackers. It, they come from research labs, you know, from from places sure. that are uh, that get funding to really deep dive and you know write up these extensive uh, kind of research papers on how, let's say, the latest version of WPI two or whatever the security protocol for Wi-Fi is. Um, you know how that can be hacked if there's any kind of vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. Like the high tech stuff is like the research arm, and if you're all about the books if you're all about the technology then perfect but i like krebs take on this you know just like you said uh, hacking in a lot of ways is more about the people it's more about the investigative side it's more about the you know kind of knowing people side than it is the technology side so very yeah. very interesting article and of course we're going to include a link to everything we talk about today in the show notes but uh, krebs on security Hey, uh, you said that it might not be a household name. Uh, he should be up there. You know, I, I think if Edward oh. Snowden can be a, ha a household name, Krebs can be a household name. Oh, absolutely. And, and I mean, I, I, Edward Snowden, that's, that's a good contrast. I, I think, again, he is a, a smart mind. I think some of the things he's done, in my opinion, perhaps e are a little ethically out dubious. There yes. <laughs> so, uh, whereas at least Krebs, the interesting thing is, um, I respect him because, and I've read books on Edward Snowden. Uh, Brian Krebs has got an excellent book, Spam Nation, and it's all about spam. And for him to do that, it took him a long time to write it. And again, I met with him personally. I sat down. We talked about the whole process. It was fascinating hearing things from him. He actually went over to Russia doing research. He learned the language. So he learned how to speak Russian in the process of writing this book. Um, so it helps you appreciate how well invested and, oh, there you, you pulled it up on the screen. Excellent. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right here. That's a book worth reading. It, it's, it, it's not for everybody, obviously, but I would highly recommend it. You'll learn a lot in the process. You also will learn a lot about why in the world do we get so much spam and why is it so closely tied to pharmaceutical things and Viagra and this and that. And <laughs> so I won't give any spoilers, but 
it's a good read and it's well written. He spent a lot of time in research on that book there. Uh, I did a book review on it probably about two years ago or so that's up mm -hmm. on my website as well after I, I kind of got excited and went through the book there. It, it was just a, I highly recommend it on the, the read of cybersecurity if you, if you do have a chance. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And so with with that being said, it was very interesting. And like I said, I uh, when it came to cybersecurity, you know, I, I uh, we have articles and shows that tell you how to, uh, you know, kind of pick a coding language to start with and how to get some of the basics and some of the certificates mm -hmm. that he said that he didn't have. Um, you know, we've talked about that kind of thing and how to get into more of like a general computer science kind of program and mindset, but we've never really approached it from a, how do you get into the cybersecurity uh, field? So very interesting article, definitely check that out. So yeah. with, uh, with that being said, Looking through some of these other ones here, why don't we go ahead and talk a little bit more about the pandemic just real quickly, uh, but more in regards to the Pentagon, a story that you sent over saying that the Pentagon is having to learn tough cybersecurity uh, lessons, which is a surprising headline. Yeah, admittedly, that's what a headline is supposed to do, but it's a surprising headline because when you think about security, the Pentagon is a secure location. I, I say that with all confidence. What do they have to learn about security? Well, I think w this was interesting. What I guess caught my eye a little bit again, looking at COVID-19, it's changed the way we live, the way we work, the way the country is secured. So they too have had to change things. And, and what this article gets into is really about personal devices. They had to take a, a kind of a business decision or calculated risks to, to do we allow personal devices to be used. And, and we deal a lot with the government. Many of the people I talk to on the phone, different government officials and procurement, even on the engineering side, even on the cybersecurity side, are still working from home. And they had to change the way they do things. It doesn't mean you necessarily have a you know, the most secure phone that you're going to be using at home or internet connection, you've got a normal, you know, broadband connection perhaps. And are they using the, the, the state of the art encryption? Probably not. Is their Wi-Fi protected? Probably not. Is their cell phone protected? Probably not. Um, are they camping on a free Wi-Fi thing? Is it open <laughs> network? Is, is there SSID broadcast? You know, all those questions from a security practitioner pops out. Those are just all the obvious ones, not, not to mention the more devious things. So when the government has to now decide, okay, wait a minute, guys, how are we going to have confidential meetings face-to-face -face that we normally would have in a secure, closed conference room, for example? How are we going to share information that is in a skiff that houses this classified information to somebody remote in the field so they could finish writing up this contract to get these airplanes on the other side of the world. Right. Those are tough questions to answer. So basically, this is really kind of opening the stage. And I, I, I really haven't thought this deep about it until I saw this story. And you get to, to get a sense of how difficult this is, not just for the Navy, but for any type of really DOD agency or support group, how cybersecurity has now become one of the top conversations to keep data secure so you know how to keep the, the, the secure area secure and not bring in the wireless threats and introduce these no vulnerabilities just because of the COVID pandemic. Nightmare. That, that, that's how I sum it up. It's basically a nightmare. Um, the good news, companies like ours, we say thank you. The amount of spending in the past two months just on cybersecurity related, and we make wireless threat detection tools. Mm -hmm. Thank you. A lot of business has been pouring out. We're struggling to keep up. This is wonderful news for a company like us. Everybody can't necessarily say that. We're, we're deemed an essential business since we're supporting the DOD agencies, since we're supporting uh, the rail, the locomotives, keeping things secure and keeping things delivered. But if you look at a lot of stats out there, the number of cyber attacks are up tenfold. That's really concerning. And that's not just toward the government, that's toward everything. And you look toward critical infrastructure, you look toward Fortune 500 companies, toward government agencies. So cyber criminals are working overtime during this COVID event. And they know why, because they're going to be a lot more successful. So I think everybody's got to up the bar and be extra careful if they're, if they're bringing things to their home and working remotely 
and, and be careful at the usual, the phishing attacks, strong passwords, password, use a good password manager. Uh, you know, are you using good security for your Wi-Fi network? Are you using a VPN, not a freebie one, one that's solid? Are you using, you know, being <laughs> careful, having good cyber hygiene across the board? Because that's really what's needed during these times. A, a VPN that you actually pay for. Uh, there have been free options out there. And um, yeah, there's been a lot of stories lately about how yeah. VPNs that you don't pay for, and even ones that you do pay for, uh, you really yeah, have to get a reputable one. Yeah, yeah. They, they're actually collecting the user data that they are supposed to be obscuring or hiding or you know whatever. And it turns out that they're just kind of keeping it on their own servers. They're collecting data about you, about the websites, uh, the websites you visit, what you click on, links you go to, uh, content that you view. And it's like, I'm paying you so that other people can't notice that. And here you are collecting it, storing it on your servers. And I think one of them was like a week or two ago that, yeah, that treasure trove actually got leaked. Um, you know, all of the saved data. Whoops. Yeah. And, and it's, it's bad when you, whenever you're paying a company for a security product. Double dipping. Yeah, and they're making money from you. I mean, it, it all goes back to, uh, what was that uh, crazy uh, site? Oh, uh, Ashley Madison. I always think of that one where you're, <laughs> you're paying that extra fee to make sure that, uh, that all will remain anonymous. Oops, sorry about that. Does that mean And then they keep everything back? in plain text, yeah. Yeah, stupid. <laughs> so that, that's kind of what a lot of these, uh, these VPNs are doing. So yeah, good point that you make. Be careful, be selective. I don't think any of the free ones out there are giving you value because of, of what you're trading for that free VPN. Um, there's a lot of other things that you can do that would be actually a lot more well, secure. So again, use caution. This the, this article from, from, from USNI.org that you sent over, the very last paragraph, I think, is uh, you know kind of the most telling. And well, you know, way at the beginning, they said that they uh, turned uh, well, they they have turn to zero trust uh, cybersecurity, which means that, you know, it's not after you get 10 feet within the door of, uh, of the Pentagon, they're just going to let you have access to everything. No, uh, everyone inside and out, no one is, uh, just kind of trusted by default as as an authority and a verified user. So that's one thing, which is something that we've talked about, uh, which is security in layers. You know, it's not just yeah. a firewall. It's not just a wall of security. It's, you know, all throughout your system, everything should be siloed. Everything should be, uh, you know, only certain users should be accessing the information that they actually need and not just kind of the whole network, blah, blah, blah. So they've switched to that. But then this last paragraph I love uh, where they're saying here that w one of the experts speaking on this saying we have to raise the bar on security uh, the nation's adversaries use the most simple techniques to enter our networks and then they hide themselves examples include service members or government workers clicking on unknown hyperlinks retaining old passwords and not patching networks that are known to have been breached which happened with the national security uh no no i'm, I'm sorry um the national health agency uh mm -hmm. over in the uk where they were still using like windows xp computers and the vulnerability, the WannaCry malware, was uh, patched, but they just never went about updating their, their systems. Uh, they're saying that the Pentagon suffers from the exact same thing to this day. Yeah, and unfortunately, <laughs> that, that same storyline is probably in most companies because of the, 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 the cost, not just to buy new operating system, new software, new hardware. It's also the cost to install it, maintain it, update it, the training side. So a proper spend to keep a company secure when they've got a large workforce is really a lot of money. And it takes a good team and effort to do. Some companies, I even recommend, if they can't do it properly inside themselves, they should hire a third party to come in. Mm. And sometimes they'll do an audit, they'll do a pen test, they'll do a vulnerability assessment, and they can really hone in and identify, hey, here's your weak points. Here's three things in your company where you fail miserably. <laughs> if you up your game on these three things, your security 
posture and stance will be so much stronger, they're going to move on to the next company. And it's really true. It's, it, you mentioned security and layers. And I always preach that. I write about that. I, mm -hmm. I present. I always talk about security and layers. I got it And I always you. like to break <laughs> it down. Think physical security. We all get physical security. Layers of locks and cameras and lights and alarms. It works. We have it. Yeah, sure. The technology improves. It changes to a ring doorbell and a, a wise camera or whatever you're, you're implementing may be different today than it was 10 years ago with ADT coming and drilling a million holes in your home. But <laughs> the point is the same. Layers of security are effective. Same thing in the world of cybersecurity. Just stop and write down what are your layers of security. If you realize you don't have any, you've got a problem. You will be the next victim. That's for sure. Of course, of course. And let's uh, let's go ahead and scare people a little bit more by current events. This one, uh, this latest one just happening today, one of the stories you sent over, 10,000 patients affected. And this is this is the unfortunate truth of so many of these stories. It's not just about, you know, these organizations. It's not just about an organization losing uh, credentials or like Garmin losing access to their services and things like that. Uh, a lot of times the victims are the people who are associated with the company and like this case the university of utah uh, health 10,000 patients affected by a data breach and this just happening well uh it looks like it was processed on july 20th and so here we are uh almost two weeks later and we're just now hearing about it uh, yeah and and uh actually reading a little bit more happened between april 6th and may 22nd and then of course they were uh Let's see. Wait, no, 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 I'm sorry. Uh, they stated in a press release June 5th, and it looks like it took them from June to July to actually go July, through yeah. all the you know, all the information and see what they actually got access to. And again, mm -hmm. the point of the story, 10,000 patients with their medical history, uh, including names, dates of birth, medical records, uh, limited clinical information, email accounts. Boy, yet again, Scott, 10,000 oh, people. Yeah. Yeah, and, and the part that I always find interesting is in, for a reader or for me uh, in investigating cybersecurity, I always ask, how did it happen? Mm -hmm. How in the world could they have let this happen? And, and as you dig down through the article, it, it shares with you, it was basically the usual, a phishing scheme and how many employees had to click on it? One. So all it takes is one rotten apple, one distracted employee, <laughs> one you know, employee that just doesn't care, maybe one employee that didn't take the best practices cybersecurity class and sit through those. Well, it's not their computer. Videos. It's not their whatever. system. Yeah, they can click on whatever exactly. they want. Yeah. So uh, what does that help us appreciate, I think, is that the, the importance of not just hearing you got to implement best practices, ongoing uh, simulations and training, even though they could be painful, like going to the dentist, I'm like, oh, I got to watch this video. I got to get trained again. Guess what, though? It, it actually works. It conditions you to stop so you don't click on something. And I think that's a very powerful example. So, And there's hundreds of companies that do it, that provide this ongoing education. Know Before is probably one of the top ones that come to mind. Excellent company. They do a lot of phishing simulations. Uh, I do some work with the guys at Cyberlytica right out of New York. Mm -hmm. They do a great job with educating people about phishing and do a lot of stuff with dark web scanning and other things to keep companies protected. The key is if you aren't doing something, you got to do something. You can't just talk about it. You got to do something to prevent your employees. Because again, it, it just takes one employee in this case. Now think about those poor 10,000 people, 10,000 patients with all that information out there. They're probably dealing with COVID situations, health situations, employment, money situations. Now they got one more layer of stress to add. And this is happening all over again and again. Each week, there's another breach that happens. And the healthcare system is really right now, statistically, it's the number one area that's being targeted, even more than critical infrastructure, even more than DOD agencies. Healthcare, number one target for data breaches. Scary. Yeah, because and, and uh, it's one of those things where 
health information is one of the few things you can't change. You know, you can't change that Ben broke his leg when he was 12 and is now taking this medication. Uh, that's that's not a pin number. It, it, pin number. It's not a pin. That's not a bank account yeah. number. Uh, I shouldn't say pin number. That's uh, that's uh, stupid on my part. But I will say that one thing that happened since you were last on, Scott, that we have not gotten your take on yet. And this is probably going to take us the rest of the show. Uh, so Twitter, July 15th, huge, huge hack. Uh, in, in all honesty, looking back, I wish I had invited you on the show when it happened so that we could have gotten some clarification. But uh, for those of you who don't recall, uh, many, 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 many high profile, everyone from Beyonce to uh, Jay-Z to uh, president, you know, uh, politicians, billionaires, I think Elon Musk uh, even got his, his mm-hmm. account access as well. All of them simultaneously tweeted out the same bogus message for like a Bitcoin scam or Bitcoin, Bitcoin scam scheme. Or yep. Yeah, yeah. They, they were like, you know, send Bitcoins to this wallet. And luckily, I don't think anyone actually fell for it. But still, they, you know, with uh, this hacking group, was able to access an audience of tens of millions through verified accounts. And I wanted your initial reaction, you know, but before we go through what was running through my head, uh, how, how, how did that make you feel about this whole system that, you know, we have verified accounts, we have uh, people with these massive audiences, and admittedly, they very ham-fisted and stupidly sent out a bad message. What if they were more nuanced? How, how did that whole thing make you feel? Well, it made me feel terrible. Am I surprised? No. Um, I should be, but I'm not, because Twitter's been targeted and hacked before. They've had some challenges. Um, the, the, the other question in the back of my mind immediately is how many people have access to that back end that can actually make changes and manipulate accounts and have access to passwords, this and that. And if you, if you look in, I think it was the Verge article, it shows that there's approximately 1,500 people that have access to Um, You know, these are employees and contractors, I guess, third parties or parties working with them to make changes to user accounts. So if you've got 1,500 people that have access to that, that's kind of a lot of people in my mind. The chance that things can happen, that that increases it, I would think it'd be 12 people, 20 people, not 1,500 people that have access. So again, all it takes is one bad guy. One guy that's on the take, one guy that, that, that's got uh, it one out contractor for, that only has like a yeah. only has like an eight week contract. I mean, there's exactly. no yeah. there's no loss there except for obviously criminal charges, but there's no loss there. Yeah, now now contrast that with the damage inflicted on it. Now I, I don't know if there's necessarily any personal damage to Beyonce and the celebrities and all these other high net worth individuals that were kind of used for this this Bitcoin scam thing or whatever, this, this tweet. Um, but more importantly, I look at it and back up and ask myself, geez, I'm a user of Twitter. Have I ever advertised on Twitter? Do I want to spend money on Twitter? They dealt with all the chat bots and the, and the fake accounts and mm-hmm. breaches in the past. And didn't the president of the CEO of Twitter had his account was hacked and this one's account hacked. Now all these accounts are hacked. Wait a minute. What do you do? Suddenly you back off and you pull your spend from Twitter and you say, well, I'll switch it on over to Instagram or to something else, perhaps. That's <laughs> well, what people yeah, might and, do. And, and, it's and just, yeah, and, and really just for the sake of time, like most of the damage was definitely in Twitter's credibility. And yeah. think about if this, ha- and, and this, the, the implications of the hack were so big. And I, I really do hope that Twitter, uh, you know, finds a way to solve this because think about if this were to happen. Uh, the example I used to explain to my family about this was, Imagine if they compromise Joe Biden's uh, Twitter account and the day before the election, uh, he says, I'm dropping out of the race again, all hypothetically. And then they had mm-hmm. 10,000 high profile celebrities that have that reach almost every single Twitter user. And they all say at the same time, wow, sorry to hear that you did your best, Joe, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. And they all verify it. like they all back up the claim that Joe Biden dropped out of the race. And that's one day before people you know go to vote for president, and they think that he's dropped out. There's confusion. The entire election, you know, could be thrown into chaos. 
they did something very stupid by asking people to put money into a Bitcoin wallet. If it were more nuanced and targeted, man, they could have done some... Uh, yeah. The president of the United States uses Twitter to announce policy yeah. before he discusses it with internal, um, you know, with the internal players. They could have really done some amazing damage. Yeah, and I think it, it's important for people to realize Twitter's got 300 plus million active daily users. Contrast that to, I don't know, what's Instagram, one Face to 1.2 billion users yeah. or something like that. I don't know if it's users versus active, but, you know, huge ratio difference. But what is Twitter really good at? Short bites that are really media related headlines. They could pop out stories, breaking news. People go to Twitter. Viral. You go to yeah. Instagram to share pictures. You go to Facebook for stories and relative things or whatever you use that for. You know, so each has its own thing. But what drives the media? Oftentimes, the Twitter feed pops up. That's driving the ma major television networks often. That's where they're reading their headlines. So to your point, you want to do some breaking news or cause some real riff in this world. It could have been Take worse. Take over Twitter accounts. Yeah. You could do some, do it, some serious it, damage. It, it really could have been worse. And Scott, I, I yeah. knew it would. That was the rest of the show. Unfortunately, we have like 20 seconds here left. Uh, everyone, scottshober.com. Obviously, uh, Scott, you sound like you're super busy with, of course, Berkeley Veritronics. Uh, everyone, yeah. we recommend you go out, check out his website, check out Computer America. And hey, Scott, we'll catch you next month. Thank you so much for being here. Look forward to it. Thanks, right, guys. Stay safe. Stay safe. Everyone, thank you so much. We'll be back tomorrow. We have another great show. Everyone, we'll catch you next time. Bye-bye, everyone.